So, uh, let's come to the uh, questions for today. Uh, and uh, let's just have a quick, ah, it's not so bad, we should be able to do this easily within the hour. Uh, so let's see what happens. Huh. <coughs> okay. Dear <coughs> Ajahn, when conflicts arises when serving on committees, what should we do? Give in or fight our way through? <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it seems to be almost inevitable that serving on committees leads to problems. I have never heard of any committee anywhere which doesn't have problems. It seems to be a universal problem almost everywhere. So it's, it's very hard to uh, have that balance on, on committees whereby you kind of keep your cool and you kind of just do what you uh, are supposed to do. But I think the, the best way <coughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> the best way is to, you know, serve with Dhamma always as your guideline. That's really the best way. And to be able to take part in the committees while you also remember all the aspects of right speech and right thought and conduct at the same time. It is better to be an invisible committee member who doesn't say much, who does only kind of, you do your duties, uh, you don't really make too much of yourself, uh, that is perfectly okay. Often that's the best way to be a committee member. You do your duties uh, without really having too many uh, opinions or arguing too much or anything like that. That is the most important thing. And those are the people I really are impressed by, who just quietly do their job and quietly do what is required uh, and don't really have too much of an ego or sense of self or necessity of feeling they have to argue. A lot of the arguing often comes from ego. Yeah, I, this is, I want it to be this way. This is myself. I think this is right. And that is often the problem. Uh, so if you can subdue, that, subdue the ego and just kind of uh, give in often, yeah, then that is it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. But don't give in if you really believe in something, if you really think something is deeply, deeply true, uh, then I think often it is necessary to uh, speak up, yeah, at least speak up, at least try to speak up. Don't do it with anger or ill will, but do it because you really feel that this is an important point. Uh, and then if it still doesn't get go through, you have to let it go, even if it is an important point. Uh, that is really, I, you know, you, you have to always remember that the practice of the path is the most important thing here. That is what's going to give you some, go, get you somewhere. And all of these worldly things are just side issues, really. And if you can't practice the path on the committee, then there's a serious problem. So you need to be able to combine the two. So uh, try to find that balance. I have noticed that on our committee in Perth it's very similar. There are some really strong egos and some people who are really quiet and just do their jobs. Uh, and I am much more impressed by the quiet people who do their job than I am with the strong egos who kind of argue and, and kind of fight things out and never really gets the committee anywhere really. Uh, and that is often the problem. Uh, and sometimes Ajahn Brahm comes there and they, they think maybe Ajahn Brahm will be the middle one, but sometimes they don't even listen to Ajahn Brahm, yeah? <laughs> then it becomes really problematic, yeah. So it can be hard, uh, it can be difficult to serve on committees. Just do your, do your best, uh, try to have that integrity, uh, and if it really doesn't work out, then quit, yeah? Uh, don't serve on the committee. <laughs> That's kind of the bottom line, uh, because it just turns out to be too difficult for you. Uh, that's okay as well. Don't have to serve on the committee. There's no obligation, uh, especially if you have done one or two years already, then you have already done a duty to support the uh, whatever uh, committee you're part of. You've done the, your duty already, uh, and that's already a positive contribution. You can feel happy about that. Uh. So uh, you have to know when it's worth, what is worth uh, fighting a little bit for, uh, but when you fight, make sure you fight with uh, coming from the right place, with a good heart. Uh, if you find yourself starting to get upset or angry, then back down. Uh, don't fight anymore, because at that point it's going to become painful and really problematic. Yeah. Okay, 
Next question. Do Arahants still have the possibility of experiencing unpleasant feelings? Arahants no longer suffer from suffering caused by cravings. But what about suffering due to uh, pervasive conditioning? That is to see samsara as suffering. Is samsara still troublesome for them? Uh, would arahants go knock door to door to spread enlightenment, uh, active being active missionaries? Uh, um, would they? I, they, they? I don't think they would knock door to door exactly. They, they might not go that far. But would they be active missionaries? Well. Remember, they have discovered the truth. The Buddha, in a sense, was an active missionary. Yeah, He went out into the world starting to spread his message because he knew that he had the answer to humanity's problems. Imagine if you know the answer to what everyone in the world is searching for. It's a very powerful thing. I have the answer to everything everyone wants in their life. Imagine knowing that and you have the highest gift to give to humanity. Wouldn't you want to share it? It's like here, I have discovered the truth about reality. This is how people are happy. Everyone in the, in the world is miserable compared to this. And of course you would want to share it with everybody because you really have discovered the most deep thing and this incredible compassion would arise in you because you know everyone is suffering needlessly. Everyone is wandering around in darkness, fumbling around, not knowing where they're going, wanting happiness, but always discovering suffering. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And then of course compassion arises and you know you have the answer to all these problems. So of course you want to share it. So there is a natural idea of being a missionary if you like. It yeah, nat comes naturally. And if you look at the Vinaya Pitaka, uh, the early story of the Buddhist community is mentioned in the Vinaya Pitaka. And there's a point where the Buddha connects all the people around him, who many of them are already arahants at that point, uh, and he says, let none of, not two of you go the same way, go into the world and spread the Dhamma. That is actually in the Vinaya Pitaka. It's not found in the suttas, but it's found in this one place. And this gives you this idea that there is an important message here to be shared with humanity. Uh, but it's, um, comes some compassion uh, and it doesn't come from the kind of idea that your job necessarily is to the purpose of life isn't to missionize, the purpose of life is to realize. It's, not, it's different from a Christian kind of missionizing where kind of, you know, you, you're not actually necessarily helping people to escape from hell. That's not the point, because you can still be a good person even if not a Buddhist. It's more like you're doing it out of compassion. So you don't push so much, yeah? It is more like you, lit, you talk to people who are receptive. You don't try to convert people who are uh, resistant, because that just leads to dukkha. Huh? But you speak to those people who are receptive to the message. Uh, so you make the message available in the world, so people have the opportunity to listen. That is really the right Buddhist approach. Uh, making it available, people can get it if they want to. If they're not interested, okay, so be it. I'm not going to try to convert you. Huh? So it's a different attitude from the uh, kind of things that you sometimes, not most Christians are okay, but sometimes you see that in Christianity where there's a big push to convert and that is becomes unpleasant because it leads to clashes, yeah? it leads to uh, uh, um, conflict when you have such a very active way of proselytizing and trying to convert people. Uh, so, but there is, you're right, there is that missionary, a little bit of that missionary sense in Buddhism as well, because you have something to share, yeah? Why wouldn't you want to spread it? It's obvious, you have this incredible message, you would be mad not to want to, sp not want to, to spread it to other people. Yeah? So do arahants still have the possibility of unpleasant feeling? Well, we were discussing that idea just the other day. Yeah? And uh, to understand this question, you have to understand that uh, there's two kinds of unpleasant feeling. Yeah? There is the feelings that are purely mental, yeah? like when you think an unpleasant thought, uh, that's also unpleasant. Uh, or if you have an uh, unpleasant physical feeling and then afterwards you react to that unpleasant physical feeling in a bad way, uh, then you have a bad mental reaction. Uh, that mental part of the feeling uh, you don't have anymore. You don't react to the world in a bad way. Uh. Yeah, you don't think about things in a negative way. So the mental aspect is gone. Uh. But you will still feel the unpleasant physical feeling and it will still be unpleasant. Uh. 
the arahant is not going to put their hand in the fire, yeah, that will still be unpleasant for the arahant, uh, but they won't crave, they won't have any kind of negative association afterwards, uh, but that feeling will still be unpleasant, so they want to avoid it. And so the difference here is what the Buddha talks about, the six classes of consciousness. In one sense everything is in the mind, yeah? Because even that physical feeling is felt in the mind in a certain way. Yeah? But the mental proliferation that comes from that uh, is not, no, longer, no longer exists. That's what the Buddha talks about, the two darts. The two darts is the dart of the physical feelings uh, and the dart of the mental feeling. <coughs> And the noble ones, uh, they no longer feel the dart of the mental feeling, only the dart of the physical feeling remains. Uh, so, uh, six classes of consciousness, uh, there is the five senses and the mind. Uh, the mind consciousness no longer experiences pain, uh, but the other five classes, especially the bodily class of consciousness, uh, can still feel pain. Uh, but it's no longer proliferated on by the mind. The mind lets it go straight away, so it doesn't carry on. Uh, it's just a more of an immediate experience. And you see that in the suttas, the Buddha talks about having a back pain, he wants to rest, yeah? Obviously he has uh, some physical suffering, yeah? uh, and then he takes a rest because of that. Uh, <coughs> you see the arahants going into jhana, that's because jhana is preferable to an ordinary state of mind. So they even, arahants too, enjoy going into jhana states. Yeah? Because it is a release from the burdens of the world and all of that. Uh, so uh, you still feel feelings, but there's certain feelings you don't feel. The, the mental things, the mental proliferation around this. Uh. Yeah, so they can no longer suffer from suffering caused by craving, that's exactly right. So, uh, cr remember that craving itself is a suffering, yeah? It's a type of suffering. When we talk about this uh, second noble truth, that one thing I didn't mention, which actually is a very important point, is that people often say that craving is the cause of suffering, because when you crave, you suffer. Huh? Yeah, so craving, but if, if craving is when you crave, you suffer. It is not the cause of suffering, then it actually is suffering. Yeah? And that's different. Yeah? And it's true, craving actually is suffering, because when you crave, you are separated from your object that you want. You feel a sense of lack, you feel a sense of something missing in your life. That's the problem with craving. And if you look at the first noble truth of suffering, it specifically says, not being separated from what you want is suffering. That's craving, yeah? That's exactly what craving is. Uh, being united with what you don't want is suffering. That's also where craving comes in. Uh, not getting what you want is suffering. Uh, so all of these things, they actually are suffering. So craving is an aspect of suffering because you feel that lack, you feel something is missing inside of you. Uh, so craving, by its definition, is unpleasant. That is not what is meant by the Second Noble Truth. Uh, second Noble Truth is the, it is the cause, in other words, it's something which leads to something else. Uh, and this is, a, I think, a mistake that people often do when it comes to understanding why craving is the cause of suffering, how this is to be understood. Uh, suffering due to conditioning, that is to see samsara as suffering. Well, Yes, the, <coughs> the arahant will see samsara as suffering, yeah, that's true, but it won't be a problem anymore for the arahant. They won't feel anything negative, they won't feel any negative association with that. They might reject it, they might feel, oh, don't want to have anything to do with it, but there won't be any suffering connected with that in the mind. Is samsara still troublesome for them? Uh, in, in the sense that they know that it is bad, but they are already out, yeah? They are already kind of beyond it, so they won't be worried about it. Uh, they know that for them it is only, the future is bright for the other hand. There's no problems anymore, uh, so they are fine. They are just waiting, like the workmen waiting for the wages, as it says in the Sariputta uh, te Teregata verses. Uh, so uh, it is not really an issue for the other hands anymore. Uh, So they can teach others, but uh, for, the, for them there is, no, there is no real problem here. Okay. 
Next question. Is attaining at least the first jhana a common, common thing among monastics? Uh, is it common? Uh, I don't know what you mean by common. Uh, um, uh, it's hard to say the percentage. I would say if you take all monastics, I would say it's probably very uncommon because the vast majority of monastics don't even practice meditation. But if you take the small part that belong to the forest <coughs> tradition, which is a small percentage of the Thai Sangha, for example, forest tradition, how many of those attain jhana? It wouldn't be that many. It's very hard to give a percentage, but it wouldn't be a very high percentage. Uh, if I look at the people I have known uh, practicing monks, uh, it's not a very high percentage who attain jhana. I can't, I can't really say how many percentage exactly, it's very hard to say. But of course it depends on how long you've been a monk, how many years you've been training. A lot of monks disrobe in the early years, yeah, precisely because they're not making enough progress or whatever on the path. Uh, so it's difficult to say, but jhanas are very close to awakening. Uh, if you are someone who, who attains those regularly, uh, you're very likely to be uh, a stream mentor, for example, as well, uh, because these things very often go together. Uh. So uh, it, these are very high attainments. So just because you're not attaining jhana doesn't mean you are a bad monastic. Yeah? You can already go uh, gone a long way on this path, and at least you're heading in the right direction, and that is really the most important thing. Eventually, if you keep on heading in the right direction, eventually you will get there. That's kind of the nature of going in one direction. Uh, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. From the Buddhist point of view, if rebirth is suffering, isn't it kind of funny when parents celebrate a newborn baby? Absolutely, it's very, very funny. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when a, that's, that's what Ajahn Brahm says, it's better to cry when someone is die and laugh when someone is born, and not the other way. Uh, sorry, cry, <laughs> cry when someone is born and laugh when they die. Yeah, that's really better because that is more in line with the Buddhist idea. Of course, dying also is not necessarily good. It depends on how you die here, so it's not really just that. Here. But it's true, when someone gets born into the world, it just means that someone hasn't finished their job in the last life. They didn't live all that well, so they had to come back into this world. Uh, and uh, usually when babies come into the world, they come in crying very often, isn't that right? Uh, they kind of start out uh, in the... With maybe they have understood what's ahead of them, so they start out crying straight away, I'm not sure. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, so birth isn't such a thing, great thing. It's funny how we celebrate these things in the modern world. And I think a lot of it comes from Christianity, the Christian idea that life is special. But life is only special in Christianity because God is supposed to have created us. Then that is what makes it special. Yeah, God gave us life. Hooray! God gave us life. Uh, but what if God didn't give you life? What if life comes from delusion and craving instead? That's what Buddhism says. It's such a stark contrast, isn't it? Such a very different outlook on, on life. On the one hand, you're given life by God. In Buddhism, it's a curse to get life. <laughs> it's kind of complete opposites. And it's very interesting how different these teachings are. The more you look at them, you see how different they are in outlook. And one of them leads to the celebration of birth. Whereas in Buddhism, we say, okay, don't know, birth, is it to be celebrated or not? It depends how, if you lead your life well, then it is maybe to be celebrated, you become a blessing for yourself and others. But birth in itself, not really a good thing, yeah? It could even be regarded as negative, uh, except that, of course, people do get born, that's the nature of things. I guess we see it as neutral, really, uh, rather than actually judging it. Uh, an interesting question you sometimes get from people, they say that, you know, the world is looking really like a really bad place right now. There's climate change and there's all kind of problems happening in the world and who knows where we're going next and whether, you know, what the world is going to be like in 30 years' time and maybe in 100 years' time the, you know, vast amounts of land will be underwater and the large cities will be flooded because of the rise of the oceans and all of these kind of things. And they say, is it responsible to bring children into the world? Maybe we should not have children here. But you can't stop people getting reborn just by not having children. People don't get reborn because you procreate or not. That's not really the thing that matters. What matters is their craving. If they crave, they will get reborn regardless. So we are not making children. Children make themselves. 
We all make ourselves, that's the whole point. That's why Sankara is the act of creation. That is what creates. So all we are doing, we are kind of allowing people to arise through our bodies. Our bodies become the vehicle to allow beings to arise. So if we are good Buddhists, if we are uh, kind parents who can uh, bring people into the world in a good way and make other people have a good life, then maybe it is worthwhile bringing them uh, along yeah, and having children because maybe we can kind of add something positive to the world by uh, adding that extra thing as good parents. Uh, so this, these are just different ways of looking at it. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm, I, I'm kind of uh, suggesting you should be a parent or anything. Uh, not at all, I'm not saying anything. I'm, I'm just saying it's neutral. Yeah, it's up to you to decide that, of course. But uh, it can be a good thing if it is done in the right way. Uh, but uh, not being a parent is also perfectly fine. There's, I don't think there should be any pressure on people to have children. Sometimes there is pressure. Grandparents say, you must have children so I can have grandchildren. Uh, and, uh, but that is not really good enough reason uh, to have children, just so that you can have grandchildren. Uh. <coughs> anyway, how does it usually end when a discussion about views get heated in the monastics? Can Ajahn maybe give an example? <laughs> well, <coughs> you, you, uh, you can imagine, you can think about the uh, bhikkhuni ordination, that gives you a little bit of idea yeah, of what happens when uh, uh, things get heated. Uh, and it, it kind of, it's, it's quite unfortunate in a sense that these things happen. Yeah, you get these divisions in a sense in the community and it can lead to se serious trouble. Uh, and uh, so that's how it can end. Uh, yeah. But there are other things also, you know, there are many kind of views that are very important, that divides kind of people. Views like Vipassana and Samatha meditation is one, yeah? Where the Vipassana community have hold one view and then you have the Samatha people. And sometimes it's hard to live together as monastics when you have very different views. Because you're thinking in different ways. And either you adjust to each other and then you kind of work it out and it's sort of work, it, it, it's okay. Or you tend to separate and live separately here. Huh? Because it's just too difficult to live with someone who has it. You can't really talk together about anything meaningful. As soon as you start talking about something meaningful, you start to argue because you disagree <laughs> with each other. It becomes very painful after a while. Better to live separately. Okay, so the Vipassana people, they go to the Vipassana monastery. Some people go to the Samatha monasteries. Uh, but what is very strange, if you look at the Dhamma, I don't think there is that much difference between Samatha and Vipassana. I don't really understand why we make this distinction. Uh, I I think it's just f a false distinction from my point of view. Uh, Samatha meditation, Vipassana meditation are just different approaches to the same thing. Uh, if either of them is done in the right way, they both lead to Samatha and Vipassana. Uh, you can't separate them. Uh, these are both outcomes of the practice. Uh, both of them arise from how we live our practical meditation lives. Uh, so because they both arise, it's this false dichotomy there. Uh, and I think it is a completely silly that we have divided the world in this way and uh, so um, it's unfortunate but this is what happens uh, but there are other views that are even more difficult to reconcile sometimes you know what is the nature of nibbana for example is a very kind of heated thing yeah? and uh, this is very often very hard to come to terms with uh, some people say nibbana is just pure cessation but there are people who argue that nibbana is some kind of eternal mind and as far as I'm concerned, that's directly contrary to what the Buddha is saying. He's saying the mind, specifically saying in place that the mind is not eternal, the mind comes to an end when you die. The idea that the mind is eternal, he specifically says Brahmajala Sutta is a wrong view. And yet, it's quite common in Buddhism for having these eternalist viewpoints. And that gets very, very hard. These are very again, very strongly held views, because views are often very, very strongly held. It's almost impossible to reconcile these things. Uh, and uh, so you end up taking one position or the other, and then you tend to kind of uh, stay with those monastics who have a certain viewpoint. Yeah? This is very hard to, to avoid sometimes. So uh, after a while, they don't argue about these things anymore. You just forget about it. Okay, let it be. They do their thing, we do our thing, and then we just... Uh, just forget about it, uh, because the argument doesn't get anywhere. You realize that you are 
uh, those views are so solid uh, that uh, there's no way you're going to be able to budge anyone. What's the point of arguing here? So you stop arguing here. How many people are currently in the ordination waiting list at Bonidana Monastery? <laughs> How many people are on the waiting list? Or oh, I don't know, 20 maybe or something like that? Uh, and uh, there's always more people coming <coughs> to the list and uh, we take, we give priority to Australians uh, because we have to by law to give priority to Australians to ordain uh, and uh, then uh, foreigners can come in afterwards. Uh, and uh, so it's quite hard to be a foreigner to get a place at Bodhinana Monastery. If you're lucky it may take only a couple of years uh, but if you're unlucky it could take three to five years uh, before you get a chance. Uh, so it can be hard. So if you're interested in uh, ordaining there, uh, put your name down. As soon as the tiniest interest arises in you, put your name down. You can always withdraw it later on, but to get on there is always the hardest part. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> see, that, that's what I would recommend anyway. Yes, please. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's mixed because they have <coughs> a certain age limit uh, at that monastery at 55 or something, or 50, maybe it's 50, I think 50 years older. Yeah, and they, I don't think they're taking anyone from overseas anymore at the Masara Monastery here. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but they don't take in anyone from overseas, uh, and even within Australia, below 50. So they're very restrictive criteria. So it is harder. Do have, uh, in our monastery, we have no age limit. Uh, yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. I, I don't know, you have to ask them. I don't know why they have age limit. <laughs> so you have, probably, sometimes they say easy to train young ones and to train old ones. What about men? Old yeah. men? Difficult to train. It cannot be trained, I tell you. I know, I've seen it, I've seen it for myself. Yeah. Be because we, are, we have compassion, so we give them the chance. <laughs> we give them the chance. And if they, they can, sometimes they can train well enough to, to make progress, yeah? They can do well enough. And it's okay. Our monastery is very free, you can basically spend your time almost exactly the way you want. And some of these people are very independent, they just meditate all day, sitting quietly in the kuti. So it's not, not a big problem. Huh? No, that's what you said, uh, that yeah. when uh, the bhikkhuni uh, you know, to strict, has to be more balanced, so you can tell them Dhammasana, yeah. bhikkhuni <laughs> I'm not going to be involved with the Masara. They have to look after their own business. Involvement is dukkha. No involvement is the best way. I've, I've learned from Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> so I know how these things work. Yeah. 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 I, I think the thing is also when you have a lot of uh, people who want to ordain, you, you, can, you can be a bit more uh, you know, you can put down stricter, stricter rules, you know, that's part of the thing here. So I think that's maybe, that's maybe they can just choose, you know, because so many people want to ordain there, they can choose very, very freely here. So uh, anyway, that, that's really up to them. I, I'm not going to say anything, because uh, just dukkha if you start saying this. And it's good, I like the bikinis to be independent anyway. It's, it's their monastery, their right to do things their way. And if I see something which is really wrong against the Vinaya, then I might say something. But that's really the only case. I mean, I go there to teach, teach anyway. Every month I go there to teach. So I teach them Vinaya rules and all kinds of things. So if they are interested, they will ask me. If they don't ask me, I'm not going to say anything here. <coughs> Besides feeling, can the dependent origination be broken at the ignorance level, since ignorance is the first link? Well, that's exactly it. It is really at ignorance that you break it. Yeah, that's actually where it gets broken. Uh, but when you break it at the ignorance level, then the break also happens simultaneously between feeling and craving. Yeah. Ignorance is what goes, and at the moment ignorance goes, you don't crave anymore. That's kind of the whole point. Uh, 
So it breaks at the beginning and it breaks at the other thing. It happens at the same time. But the focus is on the ignorance. Yeah, that's the focus because that is where uh, what actually you work on. That's what you, uh, you, know, you, you counteract. From samadhi comes seeing things according to reality that overturns ignorance and then uh, uh, the whole thing stops as a consequence. So those, that's, the, that's exactly right what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, dear Arjan, if one is reborn in the Deva realms, are there opportunities to practice the Dhamma and further purify the mind in these realms? Otherwise, the good Kama may be used up in this rebirth, and that being may be reborn in the lower realms. Is this true? Uh, are there opportunities to practice the Dhamma in the Deva realms? It looks like it. Uh, when you read the suttas, uh, you hear about the Buddha teaching the Devas. Uh, yeah, he teach, so he must teach the devas because they can make progress. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't teach them. Uh, so he teach to the devas. Uh, Buddha is teacher of gods and humans. Uh, deva, uh, deva manusanang. Uh, and uh, so I would say yes, it is possible to make progress in the deva realm. In the deva realm, also you have intentions, good and bad. You can be kind and less kind. Uh, can you meditate in the realms? Don't know. I, maybe we should ask them. Uh, you want to ask them, Ayah? See what they say? <laughs> so maybe we can ask the devas, see what they say? And uh, I don't know if you can... Uh, there's no real example, I think, of meditation in the deva realms. I'm not sure. But you can grow in wisdom. You can grow in kindness. So you can still head in the right direction. Uh, yeah, it is even said that if you uh, spend this life well and you really understand the Dhamma properly, uh, and you uh, have read the suit as well, you practiced well, then when you get reborn in the Deva Loka, if you get reborn in the place where there are areas, you will recognize the Dhamma when you get there. When you hear the Dhamma, then you will think, wow, that's the Dhamma, I know this already. And then you carry on in the Deva realm as a consequence. That's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, yes, I would say quite clearly from the suttas, yes, you can carry on the practice there. Uh, uh, and uh, But of course, if you don't carry on the practice and you get uh, lazy and whatever, then yes, you could potentially be reborn in the lower realm. Uh, uh, usually you probably get reborn step by step, but if you do bad things, especially in the Deva Loka, then maybe you can get go further down straight away, maybe. How are the Abhinyas developed? For example, the Divine Eye. <laughs> Is it by abiding for a long time in the specific jhana levels? Okay, do you have some plans here? Or is this, uh, is this you want some practical instructions on how to do this? <coughs> okay, so the, how do you develop the binyas? Yes, the deeper the jhana you have, the more ability you will have to develop the abhinyas. Yeah, the, because the <coughs> mind has that power. So the ideal state, probably the fourth jhana. <coughs> and then it says in the suttas, it simply says that you direct your mind towards whatever uh, abhinya you want to develop. That's all it says in the suttas, it's very simple. In other words, these things arise quite spontaneously, yeah, from uh, having deep states of meditation. You don't have to try all that hard. It's almost as you just direct your mind to the past life, and then you remember the past life. Uh, you direct your mind to reading other people's minds, uh, and then you start reading other people's minds. Uh. Would you like to read other people's minds? Uh? And how would you know if you uh. <laughs> You don't know, you, you ask them, yeah? Are you, you, you tell them what they're thinking, you tell them what they're thinking, and then as soon as they want it, they tell, then you know, yeah? You are thinking this, aren't you? And they think, oh, what? You know my mind. Okay, then you know it's not delusion. Uh, but it's terrible. Imagine reading other people's minds. Yeah, what, 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 what good is that? Uh, all you see, you know, most people don't have very interesting thoughts. Uh, look, at your, look at your own thoughts. How interesting is it? Uh, yeah, imagine if everyone was reading those thoughts. It would be kind of, you know, it would be. T so it's bad to read somebody. So I, I heard this story a long time ago of someone who was able to read minds in India somewhere, 
And they, and, and they thought, initially they thought it was really cool, they had to read other people's minds, but after a while they read, there's so much rubbish, I don't want to read this anymore, they couldn't turn it off. <laughs> so they had to keep on reading this minds, yeah, but even though it was terrible to read everyone's minds all the time. Uh, they couldn't, so that's, that's kind of the downside, yeah, if you can't turn it off again, uh, and then you ha get this, all this rubbish into your own mind without really want, wanting it. So it's not very useful. Maybe if you are a teacher, yeah, if like you're the Buddha, and you can read someone's mind, you can say, well, okay, be careful with all that ill will of yours. But you don't need to read someone's mind to see that they have ill will. If someone has a lot of ill will, you can see it straight away. Yeah, they are an angry person. It's obvious. That's another way of reading the mind. Reading the mind is just looking at them and saying, okay, you have ill will. It's obvious. Yes, that is really, and this is actually in the suttas. One way of reading the mind is just looking at somebody, telling from their bodily actions whether they are angry or greedy or deluded. If you have a sharp mind, you can see that in other people very quickly. <laughs> Most of the time, not always, sometimes people are really good at hiding it uh, and then you can't tell, but uh, a lot of the time you can. Uh. So that's really what you do. So number three, some of us have pets that we love. Are there ways to encourage them to do something that will help them to have a better rebirth? Uh, <laughs> if you really love your pet, be kind. Yeah, be as kind as you possibly can. Say kind words to your pet. Uh, be, do kind actions towards them. Uh, and the more kind you are to them, uh, the more wholesome will be their mental state. Yeah, they will feel at ease, they will feel relaxed, they will feel content. They will still be greedy and angry probably, they will still have those defilements there, but they will have less fear. They will, the number of defilements will be less. Uh, and that is often the best way to, to re love your pet properly, fully. Yeah, don't get angry with it when it kind of makes a mess in your house or whatever it is, which may happen sometimes. And uh, then I think that is the best way of encouraging rebirth. Uh, yeah, there is Ajahn Brahm in his room, he has a, a picture of a cat in meditation posture. Uh, yeah, but don't force your cat to do meditation practice because uh, it's dukkha for cats to <laughs> do meditation usually. Uh, so uh, just uh, yeah, just encourage, just be kind. I think that is the best thing to do with animals. Uh, okay, from Sangyutta Nikaya twelve two, the Vibhanga Sutta, Kattama Tanha, Rupa Tanha, Sadanana Ganda Tanha, Rasa Tanha, Puttabha Tanha, Dhamma Tanha, Cha. Uh, what could be classified as Dhammatana? Okay, Dhammatana. So this is the uh, ideas, mental tanna, uh, craving to mental things. Uh, yeah. So you have the basic tanha for the five senses. Anything happening in the five senses? That's the first thing you're talking about. That there, rupa, uh, forms, sounds, tastes, smells, and touchables is the first one. Uh. So these are all in the f in the five senses, and then you have anything which is in the mind is a <coughs> is apart from that. So they, you could argue that dhammatana uh, <coughs> here. Remember that <coughs> the things in the mind can be classified in two different ways. There is the mind <coughs> taking on the objects of the five senses. So, for example, when you dream at night, it's not really the five senses, but it's the mind working. But you're still seeing things, yeah, or hearing things even, or even w touching things when you sleep in your dreams. Uh, but it's the mind creating it, it's not happening through your five senses. Uh. So that is, could be argu arguably called, be called Dhamma Tanha, because it is a mental object uh, and not an object through the physical senses. Uh. If you look at the progression there, starting with the six kinds of consciousness, uh, it seems that it could relate, and then the six kinds of feeling, then the six kinds of tanha, I would say it probably relates to that particular thing. Uh. So anything which is a pure mental experience uh, happening after the uh, sense experience uh, would then be considered dhamma tanha. But of course, you can go beyond that if you purify your mind fully from the sensual realm, then you really have 
uh, you know, the jhanas and all of that, and there isn't really tanha so much in those realms uh, because you have gone beyond tanha. There might be a little bit of tanha left in terms of existence or whatever. That could be considered dhamma tanha, where you crave for existence. Yeah, the three kinds of craving, kama tanha, bhava tanha, vibhava tanha, or maybe even craving to be non-existent. Uh, yeah, that could still be there to a little extent. Uh, but there would be very, there's very little craving left once you go beyond the sensual realm. The mind becomes incredibly peaceful at that point too. So either one of those ways, I think, are, are acceptable ways of thinking about Dhamma Tanha. Okay. <coughs> Where would your bhava be when your mind is blank in meditation? Uh, uh, your bhava, when it is blank in meditation, usually means there is some sloth and torpor or something. That is the most likely thing it means here. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by blank. It depends a little bit on what you mean by that. Uh, but often when people kind of blank out, nothing is happening, it's kind of a state of sloth and torpor where they're not really sure what is happening or what is going on. And when you come out afterwards, if you know you had a kind of a, a rest perhaps, you feel maybe a bit better, but not necessarily any kind of, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's no depth really to the meditation. So this is really part of the sensual realm. Uh, your mind is part tired out by the sensual realm. You've been running around doing all kinds of things and now the mind is reacting to that uh, tiredness uh, and it kind of uh, uh, you know, blanks out. Or it could be that uh, because if the mind is quite used to sensual things, uh, then meditation can be boring, yeah, uninteresting. You wonder why I'm meditating for and not experiencing anything here which is interesting. The mind blanks out because there's no in nothing interesting going on outside when you're turning away from the senses. Uh, there's a lack of interest in what's happening. So you go to sloth and torpor or you might go to a lot of thinking. Yeah. Both of those are just two uh, side w endpoints, if you like, of the sensual realm. Uh, when you react to this realm in a certain way here. Yeah. So that is the most likely thing. But if your mind blanks out in a more deep sense, in a more deeper sense of samadhi, and you're kind of losing touch of your body and your senses, but you're feeling very bright and happy, then of course it's a different thing here. Yeah. Then it, you are in a different kind of uh, realm. Yeah. Some texts say the highest attainment is asvanyana, where the defilements are overcome. Do you agree? Yeah, asavanyana, yeah, or asavakaya is a, a perhaps the better term. Uh, the ending of the asavas, yes, it is absolutely the highest uh, attainment. It's the same attainment as arahantship. It's the same attainment as the extinction of the defilements. The same attainment as the attainment of nibbana. Uh, just different ways of talking about it. Yeah, it's just different names for the same thing, really. Yeah. That is asava kaya. Kaya means the ending. Yeah. Asavanyana means the knowledge of the asavas, which is not such a common term, but asavakaya is the normal term in the suttas, uh, ending of the asavas. Asava is just means an outflowing uh, or, so it, or a, a corruption of the mind. Uh, yeah, some people call it influx. I don't really like the word influx so much myself, but uh, it is uh, the the root meaning is a flow and is often di discussed whether it means an inflow or an outflow. But uh, uh, the point really, from as I see it, is that the mind goes into the world. The world doesn't come into the mind. It's the mind which looks out into the world, trying to find meaning in the world. That is the problem. In that sense it is an outflowing. But sometimes better to just avoid that whole topic and just call it a corruption of the mind. Yeah? That it makes it easier to uh, deal with that word. So really, it's just another way of saying the ending of defilements. There's three asavas in the suttas. The Kamasava, the Bhavasava, and the Avijasava, the outflowing of uh, uh, sensual desire, outflowing of desire to exist, and the outflowing of ignorance uh, are, the, are the three here. Uh, so just a particular viewpoint on these defilements. Uh, it was, uh, so I'm not sure why it was there. But is it the same? Maybe it was someone asking the same question. Not sure. Uh, <coughs> okay. Ajahn, can you please explain further on contact and attention 
in the context of Nama. What is contact and attention in Pali? So contact in Pali is Pasara. Attention in Pali is Manasikara. These are the words. And Pasa, quite literally, means contact. It means like coming together of things. And Manasikara means Manas, means mind. And Kara means activity. It so literally means the activity or action of the mind. The mind is attending to something. Yeah, uh, Attending to whatever is happening. Uh, attention is the transla translation for that. Uh, so... Um, um, Contact and attention in the context of Nama. What do these things mean in the context of, of Nama? Um, I, again, attention really is just a, a subsidiary thing of Chaitana. Yeah, when you attend, it means that you are, uh, you are focusing your intention in a certain area. You intend to listen to whatever is going on, or you intend to see something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that intention and manasikara are very, very closely linked to each other. Uh, when you attend, then you have ma you have also have. When you attend, you also intend. Uh, whenever there is attention, there's also intention. Yeah, they have to go together very, very closely. Uh, but intention may not necessarily, perhaps, have attention with it, or does it? Uh, not sure. I haven't really. But but they are very manasikara is one aspect of intention. That's all I can I can say with uh, uh, which, which is fairly clear. So <coughs> it it is just a, a further subdividing of uh, that particular group. And this is one of the things that you know happen in later Abhidhamma terminology, is that you subdivide these various khandhas in lots of different groups. And Sankara, for example, is subdivided into 24 or, or whatever it is. I can't remember now how many there is, uh, 28 or whatever, different subcategories, yeah, which includes attention and intention, all of these, that uh, go into the Sankara khanda. So both, uh, uh, so both uh, attention here, uh, uh, and uh, Chaitana intention are included under Sankara in the Abhidhamma. But in the suttas, uh, these are very, very closely related to each other. In the suttas, Sanka Sankara is explained in terms of Chaitana. Chaitana and Sankara have the same meaning in the suttas. Uh, so Sankara, there's five, cl six classes of Sankaras, uh, and that is the Rupa Sank Chaitana, Chaitana uh, uh, or the intention that goes towards form, yeah, and then you have the Sadda Sang Chaitana, or the Sadda yeah, sad Sang Chaitana, the, the sound, and then you have all the five cla or six classes of uh, consciousness or, or aspects of uh, senses are, are informed by that. So it is almost defined in terms of each other. Uh, they're almost exactly the same in the suttas. Uh, so very, all of these things are very closely related to each other. Uh. And then uh, attention is just another way of thinking about that. Yeah, the Buddha is using slightly different terminology. The difference between these is not great, uh, but is using different terminology to bring out different aspects or sides of these things. Uh, it allows you to understand what is going on in a broader context. Uh, yeah, although it is very, very closely related in, in reality. Uh, passa, passa is an interesting thing because uh, Passa, contact, uh, it is almost as if you, try, if you try to pin it down, it is almost as if it doesn't exist as a separate thing. Is there a separate thing called Passa? Well, in the suttas, Passa is called the coming together of consciousness, the I, and the object. Yeah? I, seeing object, consciousness engaging, three, those three things, that is Passa. But is Passa anything more than that? Well, not really. It doesn't say that there's anything more than that. It is just those three comings together. So Passa is almost like an artificial term just to show three other factors coming together. But it doesn't really have any existence on its own, it seems. That's what it looks like in the suttas. But then you come to the Abhidhamma, and the Abhidhamma says that Passa is a separate factor. Maybe based on this particular passage here, the Nama passage would actually chose Passa as a separate thing. But it may not be meant as a separate thing. It may just be meant, again, to point to a particular 
constellation of other factors, yeah? when they work together in a certain way, there is contact. It may just be making a point about how we experience the world and how that then gives rise to feelings and all of that. It may not be that Passa actually has any meaning uh, in, in as a separate entity, if you know what I mean. I'm not sure if what I'm saying that makes any sense at all. I'm getting a bit too tired to really know whether I'm making sense or not, but I, I'm just talking. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, so these things coming together like that, uh, that is what Passa kind of means. So I don't think it has any own inherent existence uh, as a special mental factor apart from these other factors coming, coming together. Uh, which is kind of strange, isn't it? Uh, and uh, this is why the division into five aggregates is more meaningful. Because with the five aggregates, uh, every one of them has a fairly clear separate existence. Well, even there, you can argue that you can divide it up into finer things. You can argue that the rupa kanda, for example, is an aspect of sanya kanda. Because the only way you know rupa form is through perception. How do I know form? I touch this table, well, I perceive hardness of the table, that's a perception. Or I see the cup, I see the shape, that's form, but that's also perception. Yeah. So Rupa Kanda could arguably be said to be a sub-aspect of Sanya Kanda. Vedana, feeling, is also an aspect of Sanya in one sense, because feeling is a perception. You perceive happy, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. So you could argue that even the five Kandas could be reduced down to something simpler here, if you wanted to. So the point is not necessarily that these things are not overlapping. The point is very often, from the Buddha's point of view, is to point out important aspects of our experience. Whether they are overlapping or not is not so important. But these are important aspects of our experience that need to be investigated so we can actually see them in the right way. Then we can get insight, then we can overcome these things. So uh, they are not exclusive, they're often inclusive. And I think the same thing is happening on this list here. They're not really exclusive things. Uh, they are incorporated within the other, kan the other kandas. Uh, and uh, for that reason, they, uh, uh, they, they, they are not so important, uh, they are, but they are important in the context of uh, dependent origination, just to understand how the sequence actually works. Uh, something like that. Uh, so, uh, okay, is that okay? Do, does anyone want to, are you all brain dead by now, or, uh, yes? <laughs> I, know, I think I know a little bit of that feeling myself, actually. <laughs> okay, let's have another short break, and if you want to come back for a meditation, I will be doing a half an hour meditation towards the very end in about 15 minutes, uh, so you're more than welcome to join for that if you would like.